Welcome to the MAKE course. I'm Rudi Schlaf, a professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of South Florida. In this video I will give a brief introduction to 3D printing. I'll discuss how a 3D printer works, I'll discuss how to design parts for a 3D printer, how to use slicing software and how to put parts on the printer bed properly. Let's do it! Here you see a schematic overview over the design process for 3D printers. You start out with your idea, then you model it in some computer-aided design software, CAD software. Then you export it into an STL file that contains information about the surface of the part. And that uh, STL file is then loaded into a slicer. And the slicer uh, creates 2D layers that the printer can understand. And these 2D layers are saved as a so-called G-code uh, data file. And in a, uh, in a G-code file, essentially what's in there is uh, how this printer head needs to move around in order to put down these layers that are specified. And so the printer then converts this G-code file into the object and then you can take your object out of the printer and that's the end of it. There's a pretty large number of printing technologies these days, uh, but in the MAKE course you will most likely use fused filament fabrication, FFF. And in that uh, uh, technique, in that technology, essentially you start out with a spool of plastic filament and this plastic filament is fed uh, through an extruder that has a heated nozzle, so there are two rollers here typically that move and that push this filament through this heated nozzle where it melts and then you squirt out here a, a spaghetti that is put down on the um, a, a surface. And so this print head just does layer by layer and um, the G-code file tells it where to go and that then in the end uh, builds up your uh, object. Okay, let's design a simple part for the 3D printer. I'm using Autodesk Inventor, but um, this is very similar in most uh, CAD software, this process. So one always starts out with sketches and then one turns these sketches into three-dimensional uh, objects uh, here with these um, create features. And so the most common is extrude and revolve and sweep and loft. So let's see what we can do here. So first thing is when we start out with a project, one needs to select the plane for the first sketch. And so I'm selecting the XZ plane and, <coughs> excuse me, put a sketch on here. And so now we can define a simple shape. And so what I had in mind here was something like this. So now we have a loop. Um, these sketches, you always need to make closed loops, otherwise you cannot extrude them uh, into a 3D part. Uh, so now the next step is, once you have the basic shape defined, you need to dimension it, give it a certain size. So let's make this here 20 millimeters and this here maybe 3 and this here 10 and let's uh, define here an angle. I really love the 45 degree angles in 3D printing. And then here, let's do another three. And this here, how about 15? And so there is still some green. That means we are not fully constrained yet. And what is missing? Um, Let's try to move things around. Ah, so I need to define this here. And let's make this here 25 millimeters. Now you see the whole thing is blue and that means it's fully constrained. So if you would now um, grab one of these corners and try to move it with the mouse, it wouldn't, it doesn't move anymore. And this is, this means that everything is now precisely defined and the whole thing is locked in place. And so now we can finish the sketch and so you see here now it turned it into the 3D coordinate system onto this plane that I selected here, the XZ uh, plane, which is this one here. 
And so now we can extrude, we could extrude it if we want, right? So it would make something like this here. But I rather want to revolve this. And you see here actually that it auto selected this loop. This is because there's only one loop in the sketch. If you had several loops in a sketch, then you would have to actually tell it which one you wanted to revolve or extrude or whatever. And uh, for a r uh, for the revolving tool, we need to define an axis. So we could define this one here, but I don't want that. I want to define this one here. And so um, that gives us this three-dimensional shape that we have now in our coordinate system. And so I want to print this in two orientations. One a time with this surface on the printer bed and one time with the surface down here on the printer bed and it's a great um, thing to do to put a fillet uh, on the on the um, uh, edges that connect with the printer bed and so I want to put one here and this is too big this fillet I just want one millimeter one millimeter is typically a really good uh, fillet for a printer bed facing surface but I want to also have it here because we will print it in both orientations and so now we can say okay and so now you see we have these smooth edges here on both sides of this part and with this we are pretty much done here for this part and so I want to save it and then um, we need to export it now into an STL file that um, the slicer software can understand and uh, so here this is auto selected STL because I practiced making this uh, video segment here already before but normally you would have to select it here because there are many uh, formats okay let's uh, save this STL file and go over to the uh, slicer software here we are in the slicer software I um, use here Ultimaker Cura it seems to be pretty popular right now so the first thing is we need to find our STL file and so here it is and now I put it here on that uh, printer bed I pre-selected a one how printer but um, this is not really important here and um, now we need to um, put this in the orientation that we want and so for example um, if you wanted to rotate it you could just um, here um, yeah, select face to align to the build plate so if you wanted to turn this around and print it on this side right on the other side you can simply uh, select it here so I said I wanted to print this in both orientations so um, let's just keep it like this here this one and now we can move it here a little bit to the side and um, let's put it on there another time so now we have a second one and so you see here this here is in the opposite orientation and the next step is now to uh, slice it and so I'm doing this now with uh, preset parameters here I printed in 0.3 millimeter um, layer thickness uh, but so there is a lot of stuff you could adjust here but I'm just using the uh, standard 20% infill these are pretty good numbers here for a standard print and um, now we can look at what this did here so let's make this a little bigger and so here now we have 83 layers that this, these objects were sliced into and so here you can take the slider here and look at each of these layers and so what you see here now on the inside right the STL file only basically tells it what to do on the outside here and on the inside it put in a so-called infill and here it was selected 20% right so basically 20% of the volume is filled with plastic inside here in this kind of uh, square pattern and so this is what basically the print head now will build up so on the inside here it will make this uh, uh, square pattern and on the outside it will make these loops here layer by layer and that's how it builds up this uh, part okay now let's uh, save it 
uh, as a G code file and so here we need to select export and um, here we should we should select G code file and then um, uh, yes because I tried to do this before and I want to override it okay and so this is it and now we can put this file into the 3d printer let's see what comes out of it so at the beginning you see here both of the orientations fare very well and it's not very challenging here for the printer at all but now you see here that on the left side we get a little bit of irregular behavior here and that clearly comes from the fact that it has to reach out here now across unsupported areas so with this 45 degree angle typically you still get a pretty good behavior and if this weren't round here but a square uh, or rectangular shape then this would actually look pretty good but since it's round it's especially a uh, challenge here to perform well but typically if you have an angle that is larger than 45 degrees relative to the uh, normal here uh, then um, it gets very difficult for these printers to print a shape successfully so let's see now what happens on the right side and so here you see that um, it you know it, it has to it had to go from this narrow stem to this large diameter in one layer and so basically it just squirted out the plastic here and it fell down and so this is why I say here gravitation is not your friend when you uh, do 3D printing. So let's uh, see how this finishes. The interesting thing is actually that now you see here it actually recovered and it made its own crappy support here with all this mess. So 3D printing actually has a, a tendency to fix defects as the layers grow on top of each other but of course this part here wouldn't be useful for anything. So, and that's it. So you see that it's very important that you have the right orientation for a part and that you also design the part uh, that the printer can really print it, right? So you need to keep uh, gravitational forces in mind when you design your parts. Okay, let's try something else. We just saw that overhangs are pretty difficult or basically impossible to print if they are horizontal. Let's see now what happens if we support an overhang on the other end. So if we rather bridge something. So let's make a simple part. So again I choose here the XZ plane and start a sketch. And I'll start out with a simple rectangle. And I'll make this 100 millimeters by let's say 30. And if you click here, it recenters. And now let's put a few windows in here, and I want to make them different sizes so we can see how this prints and how these bridges, right? We will have here bridges across empty space, how these bridges come out uh, during the print. And so, um, while this is a simple part, let me show you one thing, how to space out things in an orderly way and uh, kind of create some order in your uh, sketches. So I want to make this here longer than this and this longer than this and this longer than this. And so um, one can use formulas to uh, define such dimensions. And so um, this is 4x, this is 3x, this is 2x, this is 1x and in between here also 1x, x, x, x and on the side so we have 15 uh, units basically across here so um, let's uh, start with this one here now let's start with this one um, and make this here one unit of these uh, uh, so 1 15th of the 100 so we can basically now select this here and say divide by 15 and so we have here our first dimension and so we can do the same here I want this to be the same and so now you can just click on this one and it's D2 right and you assign D2 for this uh, gap here too or not, not gap for this uh, post and here we do the same and again Oops, what happened here? 
and so click here and we do it here and one more so now we have already same spacings and now I'm gonna do this here d2 times 4 and this here d2 times 3 and this here d2 times 2 and so this here now is already d3 and I, it would actually be over constraining now if I would do this here let's let's try it see it says here adding this dimension would over uh, constrain it okay so we're done here with these spacings and the sizes of these bridges and so the only thing now that's left to define to get these green lines away are um, the uh, height of these of these uh, windows and so here um, let's just make this here 20 and then if we want to equally space it on top and at the bottom we can again use a formula here and so we click on this and now we say 30 so that's d1 minus this here d10 divided by 2 and so now this is centered so you see it's very convenient to use these uh, formulas for the dimensions so now we're done here and we can by clicking on the little house here get an, uh, our home orientation of the coordinate system okay now we can extrude this and we since we have many loops here now or several loops we need to select the one we want to extrude so let's click on this one of course and I would say five millimeters is okay for this and we say okay and now we're almost done but remember we like to put a fillet around the surface that hits the uh, printer bed and so um, let's select this loop here okay one millimeter is always pretty good and now it's time to print this at the beginning it's very straightforward again of course and now see what happens so you see here that this works pretty well right there is not much of a difference between these four gaps but you see here that it is uh, sagging a little bit and I'm gonna measure this now for you with a caliper and so we can see how it changes how the thickness or the the, the width here of the bridge uh, changes between these gaps so here I'm measuring the uh, shortest bridge and it comes out to 5.29 millimeters you may remember that I designed this to be 5 millimeters but since I print here in um, 0.3 millimeter layers this is of course a little bit off but anyway so this is the value that the printer turns out for the uh, shortest bridge let's see how the longest bridge uh, fared so here this is the 40 millimeter bridge and you see that the value is a little bit larger so we have here now 5.5 millimeters so it got uh, thicker here or wider by uh, 0.2 millimeters so here you see what happened this is the bottom part of this window and this here is the bridge and so as the printer arrives here at this gap it uh, speeds up and squirts plastic out as fast as it can this is actually a parameter that you can set in uh, Cura if you dig deeper a little bit into the custom settings you can tell the printer how fast to run across a gap like this and it tries its best but of course because it's such a wide gap here the uh, uh, m melted plastic spaghetti also sags out a little bit here of course then later on it recovers like it did in the mess it created in my first print here uh, and then we have orderly layers again uh, towards the top end of this part but this here is clearly something to keep in mind so if you have long bridges then um, you need to keep in mind that the uh, dimensions change a little bit and if you wanted to design something that fits in here uh, another part for example then um, you need to take this into account 
So again, um, I note here design for the printer and keep gravitational forces in mind when you design a part. There are some shapes that simply cannot be uh, printed with a 3D printer without using some tricks. And a popular trick here is to use supports. And if you look at this uh, a bone fragment that they tried to print, of course it's very uh, difficult to print this because it doesn't even have a flat surface with which you could place it on the uh, build plate. And so often the only choice is to put some support structure in there that props up the object in a way that um, difficult overhangs are turned into short bridges that the printer can cross, like you just saw in the previous example. Typically these structures are designed in a way that they have designed breakpoints where the support gets really thin and that makes it easy to rip it off after the uh, object has printed. Another way to do this is by using a printer that can print with two materials at the same time. So if you have a filament printer you would need one with a, a, a dual hot end that can feed two different filaments and then switch over between them while printing. And so the supports are printed from a material that can be dissolved in some kind of solvent that does not attack the main material for your object and so after it's printed you simply dissolve the supports and then you get your uh, desired object out of this um, process. So let's see what we can do with Cura and a single filament printer like I'm using here for this introduction. Okay let's try this out. So I loaded the original part back into Cura and I have it here in that dangerous orientation with the overhang on top and let's see now what happens when we turn on supports. So there is here in the custom settings you can go to supports and click on generate support and now here you can choose everywhere or only where it's touching the build plate. In this case here it actually turns out that touching the build plate works very well and this here is just the threshold angle for the overhang uh, where uh, Cura will then put in uh, supports. Now since our overhang here is 90 degrees we are totally in the support uh, region here. Okay, let's um, slice. And now you see it created this uh, support structure around the overhang up here. Let's have a look at the layers. So you see here wherever it touches the build plate at the bottom or where it's uh, over the build plate directly it put in support. And of course it can print this here fairly well now because if you see here that that first layer it makes on top all it has to do is to bridge from here over to the nearest uh, support. And we know now from the uh, previous print that this is not a big challenge uh, for the printer. Okay, let's see how this uh, will be printing. Okay, let's print it. So you see here how the supports grow on the outside and now watch the first layer. And that looks pretty smooth like we would expect. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at the part. This shows it from the bottom. So you see this grid it started out with and then how the supports uh, are factored onto this grid. Here you see what happened when I grabbed the supports with some pliers. I simply ripped them off and they came off fairly well. And you see here that this um, layer is uh, pretty smooth but of course there are a few imperfections. Let's have a closer look. So what we see here is what was to be expected I guess. Um, there is some sag of the uh, first layer. So you probably also find here um, a fraction of a millimeter um, uh, dimensional inaccuracies and then also we see here around the uh, perimeter some of the layers didn't really catch on when it uh, put down that, that first layer of the overhang. So we see that the uh, supports can help quite a bit but the outcome is not perfect. 
And so with this, I think it's clear that it is best to uh, design parts that you can print without uh, supports and that the supports are best only used if there is no other way um, to your desired design. Okay, this introduction is coming to an end. Let me summarize what we learned here. It's crucial that you orient your parts on the build plate in a way that they can actually be printed. And of course that implies that you designed your parts in the first place that they can be printed. So design for the printer, that is a very important thing to keep in mind. Now, if you have to have overhangs, then the only way is to print them with supports properly. But keep in mind that even with supports, they don't come out perfectly. So a good idea is, a good rule is, if you can design it in a way that you don't need supports for printing it, design it in that way. Only use supports if you have to, if there's no other way, no other path to your desired shape. And if you design without supports, keep in mind that the 45 degree angle is sort of your limit uh, to fight gravitation without supports. And with this we are at the end. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.